Well, good afternoon, good evening. My name is David Rosofsky. I'm the Dean of the School of Engineering here at Rensselaer, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Davies event. This is a, an annual presentation and a lecture of the Clarence E. Davies Medal for Engineering Achievement, which is the most distinguished honor offered to an alumnus or an alumna by the School of Engineering. The Davies Medal acknowledges a distinguished career in education, in engineering achievement, in outstanding public service, or in important and groundbreaking research. Today's recipient has achieved prominence in several of these arenas. We're proud to gather today as the Rensselaer community to honor one of our best within this historic university where so many are prepared for a career in service to mankind. Today in the School of Engineering, we're building upon a great legacy with academic and research programs that prepare our graduates to meet the challenges of the world today with an undergraduate education that is interdisciplinary and entrepreneurial, with state-of-the-art research and education platforms that enable our growing research enterprise, with an accomplished and committed faculty, and with students, both undergraduate and graduate, who are academically stronger and more diverse than ever. We're extending our reach to engage partners around the world so that we can offer students and faculty the international experiences that will make their studies more relevant, and will enable them to become more sophisticated global citizens in our increasingly interconnected world. Today, we recognize an individual who is the model of such an engineer and who has achieved prominence in a career in which he has been the consummate innovator in research. His achievements elevate the honor and prestige of Rensselaer alumni everywhere. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our 18th president, the Honorable Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, who will describe the Davies Medal for Engineering Achievement Award and introduce our distinguished honor end. President Jackson. Thank you. Well, good evening, and I welcome all of you, and it is my great pleasure to welcome our honored guests, of course, Mr. Stephen Sasson. Rensselaer classes of 1972 and 1973, his wife, whom I believe is coming in, uh, Cynthia Sasson, Ms. Nancy Richards, and Ms. Ellen Coppin. We welcome all of you here. I must say that uh, life goes full circle because we're also pleased to welcome the 1998 Davies Medal recipient, uh, Mr. Kenneth DeGhetto, Rensselaer Class of 1950. Ken, would you stand to be recognized? <laughs> and of course, all of our distinguished uh, faculty, our students, staff, alumni, and alumni, thank you for joining us this evening. Now, as you may know, the Davies Medal for Engineering Achievement is named for Clarence E. Davies of the Rensselaer class of 1914. Colonel Clarence E. Davies devoted a lifetime of service to us as an engineer, to our nation, as a soldier, and as an alumnus, a trustee, friend, and advisor of Rensselaer. He devoted a large measure of his professional life to the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or the ASME as we know it, serving with vision and foresight for many years as its chief administrative officer, responsible for the great expansion of its services to the entire engineering profession, both at home and abroad. In his service to his alma mater, Colonel Davies was equally devoted. He earned the Distinguished Science Service Award of the Rensselaer Alumni Association, not only to recognize service to his profession, but to Rensselaer and to Rensselaer alumni and alumni. He served as manager of the New York Alumni Office for many years, and as secretary of the Rensselaer Alumni Association, he was influential for many years until his death in 1976. I also learned that he liked to come to Rensselaer, and he would participate with others in singing, that he had a beautiful voice. And so it's, we always have had the Renaissance engineers here at Rensselaer. And in his honor, our great 20th century benefactor, 
J. Eric Johnson, Rensselaer class of 1922, with his wife Margaret endowed the Clarence E. Davies Medal. In addition, the Johnsons' generous philanthropy enabled the construction of our famous Johnson Engineering Center, which is named in, his, in their honor. As directed by J. Eric Johnson, the Davies Medal is to be presented annually, and I quote, to a Rensselaer alumnus or alumnae who has made a truly significant contribution to the practice of engineering, to engineering knowledge, or to the furtherance of the engineering profession. Administered by the Rensselaer Board of Trustees, based upon the decision of a selection committee appointed by the president of the institute, the Davies Medal recipient is selected based on the following criteria. A distinguished career in engineering education encompassing teaching, research, and administration, engineering achievement of benefit to mankind through its universal application. Achievement as a recognized engineer who has rendered outstanding public service through his or her profession. A record of outstanding technical and managerial skills in corporate or government engineering projects. Recognition for important research projects, product design, or construction in professional practice. Now, I know that both Mr. and Mrs. Johnson would be proud of our decision to award the Davies Medal today to Mr. Stephen J. Sasson, and I am very pleased to have the opportunity to share with you a bit of his story, which itself is quite interesting. Steve Sasson was born in Brooklyn, New York, and showed a knack for electronics innovation early on. After graduating from Brooklyn Technical High School in 1969, Steve came to Rensselaer to study electrical engineering, where he obtained both a bachelor's and a master's degree, hence the two class years. As part of his graduate research, he built a model of a generator powered by light-sensitive silicon-controlled rectifiers. Very prescient. In 1974, he was hired as a development engineer in Kodak's electronics group. About a year into the job, his supervisor gave him a choice. The choice of examining a movie camera's exposure control or investigating the charge couple device, a new type of electronic sensor. Being a good Rensselaer grad, he jumped at the chance to study the CCD, and which is what a charge couple device is typically called. And he set out to see if he could build a camera based on this. Now, a year later, at the young age of 25, Sasson had successfully reproduced an image using a charge couple device, a digital cassette tape, and television. Now, do any of you know why this takes us full circle again? Remember who invented the cathode ray tube that led to modern television? Mr. DeMont of Rensselaer alone. Now, this process that Mr. Sasson developed would redefine how people take and share photographs and ultimately transform an entire industry. But Kodak proceeded cautiously and Mr. Sasson found himself part of a secret, and you can tell me if I'm right, that would be kept for more than 25 years. 25 years. And so outside of the patent that was granted in 1978, there would be no public disclosure of Steve Sasson's work until 2001. Now, but here's the thing. In conferring its Innovation Award on Mr. Sasson in 2009, the Economist lauded what it called a seismic disruption. And this is the quote. Steve Sasson's digital camera invention was not a simple improvement on the status quo, wrote an award judge. 
Ultimately, <laughs> it rendered the existing technology virtually obsolete. Now, Mr. Sasson's work continued through the 1980s in the emerging field of digital photography, and he received more than 10 key digital imaging patents. Uh, you obsolesce the camera I used early in my life. In 1989, he led the development of the first prototype megapixel electronic digital camera utilizing DCT compression that stored images to flash memory cards. Now let me digress. How many of you have digital cameras? Everybody. Thank this man. But here we go. In the 1990s, Steve Sasson developed one of the first photographic quality thermal printing systems derivatives of which are still in use in self-service imaging kiosks around the world. And before retiring in 2009, you're kind of young, he served as project manager in the intellectual property transactions group at Kodak. And throughout the course of his amazing career, Steve Sasson has been honored in more ways than time permits me to list. But the piece de resistance occurred on October 15, 2010, when the White House announced that Mr. Stephen Sasson was one of six individuals who would receive the 2009 National Medal of Technology and Innovation, the highest honor for technological achievement bestowed by the President of the United States on America's leading innovators. You know, this actually makes me emotional because he's one of ours. And many of you have heard me comment that we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And Steve Sasson is one of those giants. And with that, I am very pleased and proud to announce and formally welcome to come forward with the dean, with his family, his wife, the 2011 recipient of the Clarence E. Davies Medal for Engineering Achievement, Mr. Stephen J. Sasson, Rensselaer classes of 1972 and 73. Please. your lecture, but we're giving it to you for your achievement, not for your lecture per se. <laughs> so David, come over here and help me uh, bestow this. And let me read mm -hmm. the citation. Well, maybe we don't have the citation, but you can tell. Geez, you're going to challenge my eyes. <laughs> Steve, as you and I shared in my office, uh, the, the uh, award comes with a number of recognitions, and one of them is, is a, uh, a gold medal that was specially prepared uh, uh, when this award was started. And uh, it's, a, it's an important piece that has, obviously, uh, a, a representation of, of uh, Mr. Davies, but also has your name inscribed on the back. Oh. And with it also, we'd like to uh, present a, a, an honorarium to celebrate your achievement, and uh, we'll also be presenting you, Thank a, you. A, a, a framed certificate oh. over there that we probably ought to get a picture of too. Go over here. Head, head over that way. Oh yeah. Oh. This is nice.
Thank you very much. It's a great honor. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. And now he will present the Davies Lecture. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, President Jackson, uh, Dean Rosowski. Thank you very, very much. I, am, uh, I can't tell you how, what an honor it is to be here. I, I feel like a, a guy who's been out on a long journey and uh, coming back home to tell the folks what I've been up to. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, so thank you very much for the kind words. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit of it today about uh, the development of digital photography um, uh, that took place many decades ago, but uh, the ripples of which are still occurring. And uh, in order to do that, to just share with you some of the history behind how digital photography evolved, largely inside a film-based company. Um, and so some of the history behind that. And then also I want to take a few minutes at the end to share some learnings uh, about driving uh, uh, innovation, dis discontinuous in innovation inside of established corporations or institutions, which is, I think, a challenge that will always be with us. So um, let me uh, begin here. Is this? Uh, oh, thank you. You've got great AV support here today. Um, this is a story about the development of a digital camera that uh, was basically a small prototype camera that uh, took pictures digitally, uh, recorded them on a cassette, and then played them back on a, on a conventional television set. And this took place uh, in uh, 19, took my pictures, first pictures in 1975 uh, in Rochester, New York, in a small research laboratory. And uh, although uh, there were many uh, demonstrations inside the company of this uh, system. Uh, there was no public acknowledgement, as uh, President Jackson referred to, until 2001, um, due to the sensitive nature of it. Um, but as part of that, um, as part of any research laboratory uh, a project, even though this was a pretty small one, I wrote a technical report, and uh, largely the technical report describes the te te technology that was involved with this device. But I had a chance uh, to write a small paragraph as to what I thought the impact of this might be. Um, I, I was just winging it. I wrote this in 1976. And uh, well, we have quite a few people here, so I think if half the people in this room read it, we'll double the number of done so in the last 30 years. Um, <laughs> Technical reports uh, are not the way to get out uh, some forms of innovation. But I want to share with you where it began. And uh, you have to indulge me just a bit because I'm, I'm, I, I, this was just so much fun to pull this. I don't keep much stuff. Uh, I'm not a pack rat. But I have kept some stuff because it really mattered to me. And one of them was this year is a copy of the, th the thesis that President Jackson referred to. And here's a hand drawing of my little experiment that I did. And that was my first introduction to doing uh, power control through optically, uh, uh, optical thyristor uh, devices. And uh, I, went, I wrote to Pittsfield and GE, got some free parts and built it. And Dr. Bose, who was a professor here at the time, was my thesis advisor. And so that was the first time I got introduced to uh, controlling with light uh, anything in the electronic domain. And then if you'll... Pardon my indulgement, just a little bit more. Um, I also, at the same time, took a survey course in my fifth year under Dr. Gandhi, who was a head of electrophysics. And um, his uh, criteria for grading a grade in the course was to write some paper that thrilled him, uh, because it was a survey course and he wanted to learn something from us. And so I took the opportunity, the first time I ever remember doing this, where I wasn't answering questions, I was asking them and then trying to answer them. And I was very afraid that I wasn't going to do very well on this paper. And when I turned it in, I was really worried. I said, Gandhi's going to kill me. And uh, turned back, he wrote a nice note that you can see up there, uh, where he, uh, he gave me an A and he uh, wanted a copy of this paper. And it was one of the biggest thrills of my life, having a guy like that recognize uh, my attempt. It wasn't always right, as he said here. But uh, he said it was a good try. 
And uh, I put that up there for two reasons. One, I've been waiting for 38 years to show somebody this. <laughs> uh, and the other is, is that uh, you professors and instructors in the audience, what you say to your students matter. It really mattered to me. And the reason I say that is because when I had that challenge about looking at CCDs later on, it was a short conversation that I had with my research lab advisor, or my research lab head when I was working at Kodak. And he asked me about CCDs. I had no idea what CCDs were, but I knew it was silicon. I knew it had to do with light and potentially imaging. And the reason I had the courage to say, yeah, let me try it, was because somebody else smart thought I did something good. And so I, with that little bit of uh, boost, that helped me take a chance back then. And so um, I just wanted to show you that. Um, charge couple devices that were, first came out were invented in uh, Bell Labs in the late 60s, Boyle and Smith, quite well known for their invention here. Uh, but the com first commercial devices didn't occur until the early 70s. And so uh, I got a hold of one of these devices. This was the device that uh, my supervisor, Gareth Lloyd, asked me to just play with and see what I could do with it. And so here's a picture of it. It was the first area array that uh, was made available. And um, it had uh, 10,000 pixels, 100 by 100 matrix, or 0.01 megapixels by today's standards. Um, and it had an interline transfer architecture, which meant it had interlaced scanning because people were trying to replace Viticons and television systems at the time. And it had a pretty small active area, and uh, I say it was difficult to work with because when you got this device, it came in a little plastic box, and in the box, the chip was sitting in there, and on top of it was folded a piece of paper. And on the piece of paper were 12 pre-printed voltage designations, and in each one next to one of those, in pencil, was written the actual voltage that this particular device worked on when it left the manufacturing line. And at the bottom said, good luck. <laughs> uh, and the reason was because if any one of these 12 voltages were off, um, it was going to, be, uh, going to be a bit of a challenge uh, to get it to run, run again. So uh, it was very challenging technology at the time, but tremendous fun. And so um, I thought about this problem, and um, I, I decided to take an all digital approach. Now, I would love to tell you that I had all the great foresight that everything was going to be digital years later, but I didn't. I, I had done some work in digital technology, and I thought I am totally incapable of building anything mechanical here. Because uh, to, to capture any kind of an image, I'd need some sort of a helical scan mechanism. This was, uh, was prevalent back then. So I decided if I could just digitize this thing, I, would ha I wouldn't have to deal with any mechanical complexity. So that's why I went all digital. And I thought, if I'm going to try to do some imaging with it, why don't I try to capture an image? And if I try to capture an image, why don't I try to get something that sort of looks like a conventional camera so if I capture it, I'll put it on some sort of removable storage mechanism so that I can take it from the camera. And so then I thought, well, I have no way to look at this image, so I have to look at it electronically as well, because so, I had no way to print it. So I thought, well, okay, I'll try to come up with something that uh, electronically be able to view the image. And then I, that required building a playback device. Now, this was in 1974. There were no personal computers. There was none of the infrastructure you have today. So I had to build a special device for that. And half the effort of this project revolved around building that special device. And one of the things I want to mention here is that, as any institution has, had lots of smart people at Eastman Kodak Company. Boy, they just knew everything there was to know about imaging. And so I had lots of help. Anytime I had a question, I could just call up somebody. Sometimes the question was a little crazy. But they were really uh, more than willing to help and answer. So I had a, an enormous. Uh, uh, enormous bench to help with this. So, after about a year of struggling and trying, this is what emerged. Now, the, you know the saying, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, this was really beautiful to me. Um, this was a self-contained camera that as I could pick it up and carry it around. It was about the size of a toaster, weighed about eight and a half pounds. Um, powered by 16 AA batteries and uh, I had uh, a little a digital cassette. I found a digital data recorder. Actually, it was used for well logging at the time. It ran off a 12 volts, fit in my camera, so I used it. Um, we stored 30 images on there. And then, lucky for me, being an Eastman Kodak company, I was working right above the XL movie camera line, where they had Super, super 8 movies. The uh, active area of this was smaller than that of a Super 8 piece of film, so I went downstairs and out of the used parts bin stole an old XL55 movie camera, and that was the optical assembly that I used for this. And so that's how it all came together. 
Now, this is how the camera is pictured today, but uh, this is how I remember it. Uh, we only had a chance to build things once inside this device. There were no prototypes. There was no breadboarding. We had no money or time to do it. It was just me and a very talented technician named Jim Schickler who really helped me with this. And so we built it. So it, all thing had to be unfolded, and it had to work in this position because it broke and we had to fix it all the time. So this is how I remember the camera. And so this camera came together, but how do you view the pictures once you capture the image? Well, how you pick, captured the image, by the way, was you would push the button. You didn't see it in there, but there's a little button on the side that would turn the power on, and the second detent would capture an image. It was a 50 millisecond exposure, and it would download those 10,000 four-bit words, only black and white, into an onboard memory. And then from there, it was read from that memory rather slowly over the course of about 23 seconds to that digital cassette. So image capture time was reasonable, 20th of a second. But uh, in order to take a second picture, you had to wait 23 seconds to get all the information to the tape. So that's uh, how it worked. But once it was on the tape, you had to view it. So had to build a playback unit. There were no personal computers, as I mentioned before, but there were some microprocessor development systems that were available. And uh, so I, I came up with an imaginative explanation as to why I needed one of these things and got it in the lab. And then uh, because it had a new bus architecture, we could actually modify the electronics pretty easily, build frame stores and all the things necessary to read that information off the tape and then actually assemble the image. Remember, I had 100 lines of information. And if you're familiar with video, you know that a conventional NTSC signal displays about 490 lines. So we actually had to do image processing at the time. I had never done that before. So, but we did interpolation of those 100 lines into 400 lines, did that in assembly language which is, I'm sure you know, a delightful exercise. And um, that's what happened. And so what you have here is, uh, this is what the picture, this is the only picture I have of how the camera performed. Uh, it was in the technical report. Uh, interesting story about this picture. When you take a picture in ins inside of Eastman Kodak Company, you have to do it a certain way. First, to evaluate any imaging system, you have to use a standard test target. I got a test target from one of the image science friends. And this was the famous boy-dog image inside the company. If we backlit that, I took a picture with the uh, prototype camera, took the tape, put it in the playback unit, had it displayed on the television set, moved the television set next to the original image. And then I had to call a Kodak professional photographer because I was not allowed to take pictures inside of Eastman Kodak. And he had to come up with a film camera and take a picture of this. And so that's how we historically recorded this. I always thought that was a little bizarre, but that's what happened. And um, I'd like to show you a little bit here. I'm going to blow this up and just to show you how this image really had a lot of warts. Because digital imaging back then, when I talk about the reaction, this is what people were seeing. You had everything that was bad about digital imaging. You had contouring, that is the lack of bit depth. And you can see that up in the upper right-hand corner. You have absolutely no resolution. There are whiskers on that dog. And uh, you can see the interpolation, uh, the stair-stepping that was taking place there. And you can see the photoresponse non-uniformity and the dropouts associated with the imager. That was the best one they could make at the time. So it had all of the defects associated with a, 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 a sampled image or a digital image at the time. And so this is what people were looking at when they were uh, looking at the, this result. Now, a little bit about the timetable here. It started in 74. And we captured our first image in December of 1975. The first image was kind of strange. Um, we had no way to look at partial images. The only thing you could look at for the year we spent building it was oscilloscope traces and voltage measurements. There was no way to look at anything. So finally, after we built the camera and the playback unit, I looked at Jim Schickler, the technician was working with me, and, and I said, we've got to take a picture of something. And our lab was about as unphotogenic a place as you could imagine. So I walked down the hallway. I found a young lab technician. Her name was Joy Marshall. She was sitting at a teletype. And I asked her if I could take a head and shoulder shot of her, and I did. And uh, she knew us from the, down the hall. And so the camera started to record the image. I walked back to the lab, popped it out, put it in the playback unit, and up popped the image on the screen. And what it showed was her hair. You could see her hair. You could see the background. And her face was complete static, totally unrecognizable. And um, I was thrilled, and so was Jim. And I remember saying, so much is working. This is fantastic. This is great. And he said the same thing. Man, we knew a thousand reasons why you might not see anything. Now, Joy had followed us back into the lab, and she was less impressed with the image. Um, she said, needs work. Turned around and walked out. Um, but I, had, I had reversed the order of the bits. When I designed the playback unit, I, 
I just reversed the order. So if it was all zeros or all ones, it was okay, but anything in between was sort of flipped. It took us about an hour to figure it out, and that's when we had our first image. Technical report was published, some of the pictures you've seen from here. It was in 1977. We applied for and was granted a patent for the first digital camera in 1978. And as President Jackson indicated, that was the only public disclosure of any of this work that took place. Uh, and any inquiries we got about this patent, I had to refer back to public relations. I couldn't respond at all. Uh, and then we started having internal demonstrations throughout the company uh, in 1976. Let me describe what they're, what they're like, because this was interesting. What would I do is I would uh, gather people in a conference room with a long table down the middle, and people would sit on either side. And I would bring my camera from my laboratory, which is just down the hall. I'd fold it up, say a little prayer, hope it worked, and then walk down. And I'd walk in the room, and I'd take a picture immediately of the person who was sitting on the right side, head and shoulder shot. And then while I was, uh, I would then describe what I had just done and what this thing was to cleverly hide the 23 seconds I needed in order to get the next picture. <laughs> And then I would walk to the other side and I would grab a picture of that person and then I would pop that uh, camera in the middle, pop the cassette out, give it to Jim, he'd put it up there on the playback unit, which we had moved into the conference room, and up would pop the picture. And uh, I don't think we ever finished a demonstration. I had a whole thing prepared, but the questions started coming. And so I want to share with you some of the reaction that we had uh, to this. Um, First of all, we, the, we, we went and showed this to uh, a number of people. And in any organization, you show it to your boss. And then when he's comfortable with it, he shows it to his boss. And you work your way up. And we worked our way pretty high up the company. But we never got to the CEO or the head of the corporation, although they had heard about it. And they asked about it. And, uh, but they were said, no, we really don't want to show it to you because it's not ready for prime time. Which, that is definitely true. I was a little disappointed, but I said, well, I understand that. When you think about it, you, here we were taking pictures without film and displaying them without printing on paper at Eastman Kodak Company. <laughs> Not a good way to get invited to the Christmas party, I guess. It, was, uh, it, was, it, was a, it created a lot more questions than answers, and I think that made people nervous. But uh, the concept really, when they viewed it, it, they viewed it as basically too far out there for serious consideration. What I mean by that is it wasn't just the fact that it didn't use film. It didn't use any of the existing infrastructure that we had in place for photographic world. It didn't have photo finishing. It didn't have printing. It didn't have anything. Photo albums. What, what, what is all that? Nothing was used. And so it was very disruptive in the sense that it didn't use any of the model that, that existed. And people weren't terribly disappointed with what we had at the time either. So they weren't looking for a change. They were quite convinced that people would not want to look at their tel pictures on television set. They were convinced that nobody would be happy unless they had a print in their hand. Now, I thought that was a little odd because we had a sizable business with slide projections. Um, but uh, they were convinced that that was the case, that that would not be uh, uh, very uh, acceptable to anybody. They were quite sure about that. And then tons of questions. Tons of questions about uh, what's a photo electronic photo album going to look like. Remember, there's no personal computers. There's none of that around. Um, and then when are you going to get film quality up to, to film quality size, right? And then the big question I was asked all the time is, well, when would this be available to the consumer? Now, you know, when you're doing stuff like this as a technical person, you, you think they're going to ask you, well, how did you get this clever technical thing to work or that thing to work? Or they didn't ask any of that. He asked me these questions. I hadn't thought about how, how do I know when it's going to be available? I don't know. But they kept asking me, so I used Moore's Law because it was a digital product. And I called the research labs and I said, OK, how many pixels would I need in order to make a reasonable consumer? I said, a reasonably acceptable, which means the lowest quality that can get away with uh, picture. And they said, oh, that's easy. A million pixels, two million if you want color. So I said, OK, I've got 10,000 here to two million. I used Moore's Law of doubling. And then uh, I, didn't, I had no idea if it applied to CCDs at all. Um, and I came up with between 15 and 20 years. And uh, that was a complete guess on my part. And uh, you'll see later, we introduced our first consumer camera 18 years later. But I think that was just a combination of mistakes everywhere that just averaged out. <laughs> now, one thing I want to point out to you about this is that there's the technology there's the concept that you're trying to get across. And then there's the technology you're using to demonstrate your concept. I used a completely digital system. This was completely digital, right from the output of the CCD right to the input pin to the television set. 
Um, but that was not a benefit. It might seem strange to you now, but digital was not the technology of uh, choice. It wasn't in vogue. It was considered very delicate, esoteric, expensive, unreliable, whatever you want to call it. There were no consumer products. Like today, you need digital on the title of anything you're selling in order to sell it. But back then, it was a detriment. So digital did not help me in this concept. It helped me demonstrate it. It worked. But it wasn't, in terms of moving forward, it wasn't very helpful. When I, I like to mention that to people because sometimes people look at this and say, wow, digital, of course you knew digital was coming. Digital did not help me in this presentation right there. And then the other aspect of this I think you have to take into account is the whole world's inventing along with you. I hadn't considered any of the uh, things you have up here. And I, and I think if you think about a digital camera, its utility would be not nearly as great if you didn't have these things. So the whole world infrastructure was changing. I hadn't considered that. And I had just considered it about in terms of taking pictures you know, without film. And so uh, this part of the discussion was really not taking place in 1976 when I was showing this. So there was this reaction to that as well, and that was uh, uh, certainly part of the, the, the pushback. Because they didn't see the world, nobody saw the world changing in so many ways over this period of time. Now, I just want to briefly touch on what happened next, because uh, this is really kind of interesting. At the same time, uh, I was working at Kodak, a very famous researcher, Bryce Beyer, developed what's called the color filter array. It's called the Beyer array. If you have a digital camera, whoever, whatever make, it has a Beyer array in it, no, no doubt. And he solved this problem before we had any digital cameras. He was an image scientist, fascinating guy. And he worked on this problem of how do you do two-dimensional sampling um, and be able to fool the eye into thinking it's a full color image, even though every single spot was not of every single color. And uh, so this, this was invented around the same time. I, I, I met Bryce uh, one, once or twice, and I chatted with him a little bit. But we never really connected on the whole entire problem. Uh, he was trying to solve this as, a, as an image science, an image perception problem. And I was trying to figure out what technology I could apply to get this thing just to work. And I was afraid of color, by the way. I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, but in the 1980s, you saw uh, a, a development called Still Video Floppy. Some of you may remember it, but it was a, a small two-inch disc that rotated at 60 hertz, and it recorded basically a television signal, slightly modified to, for this application. And what you would do is capture a single image or a single field or two fields, and uh, you would then play it back on a special player on a television set. So it was NTSC resolution, uh, but it was quick, and several companies like Sony and Canon were, uh, were pushing this. And, I thought this was great for two reasons. One was it sort of woke the company up to new competitors. Our competitor before this was Fuji, Agfa. But all of a sudden, people like Sony and Canon were talking about making pictures. And so it woke the company up to starting to look at this. And so that created more energy around this. And we got more interest in pursuing this kind of activity. And the other one was it simply wasn't going to work. The NTSC, the restrictions on an NTSC encoded signal uh, are far uh, worse than anything photography could produce. And I think one of the things you have to realize in a displacement technology is that if you're going to have a displacement technology, you have to meet the existing technology in every attribute and then exceed it in at least one. You can't ex ask a public to accept something less on one aspect to get something better on the new one. And so uh, it, wasn't going to be, uh, it wasn't going to be an easy acceptance, but it really started people thinking about it. And then um, in 1986, Kodak went public with some of their work. They introduced and demonstrated the first megapixel sensor. Why megapixel? Because we knew that the evolving electronic still imaging world was going to, we didn't know exactly where it was going to go, but we knew it was going to revolve around the computer and not the television set. And therefore, we didn't have resolution restrictions, which we wouldn't accept because we knew what good photography was and we knew what people would accept. <clears throat> so we introduced that to demonstrate that we were developing a capacity far beyond those of what other people were developing at the time because they were interested in just replacing Viticon tubes which had limited resolution. And then of course uh, there was image compression which I think represented the last straw in the technical set of dominoes that had to fall in order for digital photography to take place. There was a lot of work done in the mid 80s. We did a lot of stuff uh, for co in compression. We had a lot of compression experts there. And then that resulted in, in uh, the camera that uh, President Jackson kindly mentioned. Uh, uh, was a, a, a megapixel camera. You couldn't tell it from a, 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 a Nikon D40 today. It, it, well, you probably could because it's a little bigger. But it, was, uh, it had 
DCT compression, it had memory cards, um, it took burst, burst capture, and it was functioning in 1989. And in my belief was that was, the, that was a demonstration, at least internally, that digital photography was no longer an uh, if, but when. And so uh, that represented, I think, the last straw, like I said, in the late 80s. And so I just want to quickly touch on some of the uh, digital cameras. When you introduce a new technology, you go to a market that allows, that will accept the new technology. And of course, the professionals were very interested in that. Why? Because they, digital cameras could do one thing that, photo that, that regular photography could not, and that was your ability to transmit the image relatively easily so you could get it back to your newspaper so you could get that critical shot on the front page very quickly. That was worth money. And you had to have money to buy these cameras. The first one was a Hawkeye called a Hawkeye Imaging Accessory. We couldn't call it a camera. And uh, it was uh, developed for basically the government. They were the only people who could afford these things at the time. This was, we used Nikon bodies for these. And we built the electronics all special. And um, this one here uh, went across, it was the first, I think, digital camera across the, the space shuttle in 1991 was, was the one I've shown there. And then about a year later, they, the professional DCS came up, and it, now you could see the actual image when it was captured in 92. This was, uh, these, we sold about 1,000 of these. They sold for about $25,000 each, and they came with a big hip pack that you had to carry that big thing next to you. But again, it provided instant review and an ability to transmit to the newspapers, and this was worth a lot of money. So that became uh, a big selling feature. And then... There was what called the DCS 200. Interesting story about that. First all-in-one digital camera that showed up. We sold about 3,000 of these. And um, you'll see, for the first time, Eastman Kodak appears on the camera. And that was because our designers were getting a little annoyed. We used Nikon bodies all the time because professionals like Nikon. And uh, <clears throat> they kept thinking, well, Nikon developed this and got a little insulted. So they uh, made sure the Kodak appeared in bigger letters. And so that's what it was there. <laughs> Jim McGarvey, the designer of that camera, told me that. And they were quite insistent upon that. And then the first consumer camera was the Apple Quick Take. Why do I call it an Apple Quick Take? Because we could not market this camera. This camera was developed specifically for Apple because they requested it. We had the capability to do it. We designed and manufactured it, but we didn't have the capability to market it, simply because we didn't have the channels or the channels were unwilling to deal with this because you were dealing with the real conflict of existing film-based channels and this new electronic approach. <clears throat> I also am told by the, the developer of this that they had to make it look like a binocular instead of a regular camera. They did not want any confusion. So here we're in a difficult period uh, for, uh, for the development of uh, photography. Um, but then we did finally get, get a, I think it was a DC-40, it was about a year later. It was a little bit higher resolution. This was like 756 by 512, I think, and stored about eight images or so. Um, <clears throat> and then we started marketing cameras under our own name. And then I think starting in 1997 or so, compression appeared, and then you had megapixel consumer cameras. And then I think the resolution of consumer cameras has increased by one million pixels per year since then. And so I think today now, I think you can buy consumer pocket cameras that are about 14 megapixels. So, so um, I wanted to share with you just the history of that and how, it, how it's taken off since then. And um, I just wanted to share with you some observations. Um, because one of the interesting things about being on this journey is I had a really a front row seat to a major technological discontinuity and how it uh, affected an entire industry, a company, the people around me, the people I work with. And, um, and I was lucky to be in some way involved with this over that whole period of time. And I learned a couple of things. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to share some of this stuff. Uh, so first realizing that most of us don't work in startup companies. We work in established organizations, organizations that are proud of what they do and probably aren't looking for something too dramatic a change. And uh, engineers basically, I think, are change agents. That's why you're here. You want to do something new. You want to do something great. Well, change, the engineers are usually at the center of these technological discontinuities and unfortunately often don't survive them very well. And so I thought I'd spend some time, you know, as one engineer to another, um, sharing some learnings around how to best survive proposing disruptive innovation with inside your organization. <clears throat> and um, the first thing I want to talk about is culture. 
Now, culture is a really powerful thing, and you don't want to get on the wrong side of it. Um, you have to put your concept in terms of something your organization understands. Yeah, avoid the variations that you're tempted to make, to, to, like to make it more interesting. You know, it could do this, it could do that. Simplify it and make it look like what it was. That first cassette I had, I could have changed the recording density on that to hold several hundred images. It would have been very easy to do. I elected to record 30 images. Why 30? Because it's between 24 and 36. It allowed people to get comfortable with this concept. If I had put a, a couple of hundred images on there, that would have been another interesting aspect of this concept. But it would have, because we had no personal computers, it would have further distanced the concept from the culture that I was in. So I think what you want to do is keep your secondary advantages in the wing and keep it on a familiar plane and just go with the essential elements of it. I, I would say do not uh, challenge your company's culture. Use it as best you can. Uh, next thing here is, is friends. I, I really do think people like innovators. They just don't like being seen with them. Um, <laughs> And I think the reason your, your, um, your private support will be greater than your public support has to do with our education. I think we, we are ingrained to think that we have to provide answers. We're paid to provide answers. We're scored on providing answers. And innovation is about generating good questions. You may not know the answers to the question, but as lofty as that sounds, people are not comfortable uh, with this stuff. Uh, even if they're good questions, they're not comfortable just having a question hang out there. Now, I had no basis for uh, arguing with the concept that they had said that consumers would not want to view their um, photos on a TV. I really didn't have an answer to that. And I, so I couldn't counter it. I found myself saying, you know, I don't know the answer to the question, but please keep listening to my idea anyway. It's uncomfortable for innovators and it's doubly uncomfortable for your friends. So you have to expect that. In public relations, <laughs> any endeavor that involves change is an exercise in public relations. And the average engineer has no background in this art and, in many cases, has little regard for it. Um, remember, you're, that's a mistake, because you're trying to get across a message to a skeptical audience. Um, you have to pay attention to what they're sensitive to. Classic example of what not to do. You know how I had those meetings where I invited those people to see that camp? You know what I entitled those meetings? Filmless photography. Bad choice. <laughs> you know, given the audience, you know? Um, so you have to think about things like that. So two things here, two things about this. One, be honest about your idea's shortcomings. There'll be plenty of people that'll tell you all about why it won't work. Don't try to minimize it. Don't try to defend it. Just say, yep, it won't do that. Yep, I have that question. Yep, go ahead. Keep doing that. And then the second thing is never discount or diminish the present technology or approach that you might be displacing. There are many reasons not to do this, but the one I want to highlight to you is that if you discount the present approach, you run the risk of being the object of challenge instead of your idea. Your motivations get challenged instead of the idea of the object. And that's never a good place to be. So be wary of that. And roadblocks. I have roadblocks are temporary. It seems every organization seems to always have a natural desire to find all the reasons why a new idea won't work. I think we have built in no organizations inside of our, our, our structures. Um, and this goes for whether it's technology or organizational or financial ideas. Uh, the limitations always seem to come and get they never, never ending in terms of suggesting. So, and you have to realize that often these are informed opinions of well-meaning, highly skilled experts uh, in the field. So it's important to listen to them, okay? And it's just as important to imagine that an answer can be found, okay? Perceived roadblocks are exploded every day. I don't have time here to tell you all the reasons I had over the last 35 years why that digital camera that's in your pocket or purse right now would never exist. When faced with a roadblock you can't do anything about, just imagine that it's gone and get on with your work. Remember, you don't have to invent everything. And then I call, finally I call these the three Ps. These are the things that have to do with person, personal interrelationships. You know, the first thing anybody sees about an idea is you. How you relate as a person, your concept, determines kind of its initial reaction. So I have here patience. 
Remember that describing for the first time, you're going to get pushback. We often bemoan the fact that we clearly explain what this idea is, and they just don't get it. Remember, you had the luxury of thinking about this idea for months or years, and they're just getting it for the first time. It comes from being comfortable with the present state, and they're heavily invested in it. You have to expect that. So be patient with the resistance and get comfortable with the questions. It's a sure sign you're being heard. Persuasion. And engineers are not good at this as a group. You know, when we, well, we, don't, when we don't get a good re response to something, well, we just tell it to them again, this time only a little bit louder, you know? Um, <laughs> it's about listening to the other person and finding a place for the concept to support their hopes and their dreams, all right? Persuasion is about reason and emotion. Emotion, there's a, there's a word engineers really hate. <laughs> Uh, let's call it imagination or intuition, okay? Um, but the early stages of an idea, you don't have enough data to use logic alone. You need to engender faith in an idea, instill curiosity in the concept, and that requires you to, lead, to, to want to lead others to want to take a chance. You have to try this. This really can be fun. Oh, sorry, let me go back. I have one more here. Um, the last one was uh, persistence, and uh, <clears throat> that's a dedication to an idea about a different way of doing things, and it's an intelligent dedication. And that's the last thing you feel when you're pitching a new, a new idea, intelligent, because you're getting hit with questions you can't possibly answer. So it's a strange way to describe it. But I'm suggesting a dedicate, your dedication be tempered by the thoughtful consideration of these questions. No matter how clear <clears throat> it appears to you, uh, there are things that you haven't thought of. And that will, these things will never inevitably shape and bring your idea to new levels. And these challenges will be your first indications of where these changes will come from. So don't let the questions dilute your enthusiasm. Use them to fuel it by testing and refining your vision. So just some observations from a personal side about innovation inside of established companies. I want to end my talk, and all talks have to end with a story, so I want to tell you one. And it has to do with when I was uh, on a tour in 2005, I believe. I was in China, and they asked me to go over and talk about the first digital camera because there was a lot of interest in this. They have a lot of interest in history there. And uh, I was there, and uh, I was doing a lot of interviews. Um, in China, they do interviews. They bring the press in, and you sit at a table, and they ask you questions, and then the press goes out, and another one set comes in, and this goes on all day. And um, during one of the breaks, uh, I had brought with me one of the cassettes that I had taken some of the first digital pictures with me. And it was sitting there on the table. And then, as I sat between my breaks, there was this camera we were introducing at the time. It's called the Easy Share One. It was a marvelous device. It was a Wi Fi connected camera with six megapixels. It had a, about a 256 megabytes of internal memory. It had a nice swivel uh, LCD on the back. It was really quite, quite something. And uh, we were introducing that camera. And they were sitting there, and I I noticed they were about the same size. And uh, so I, I had a thought. And it's, it has to do with engineers. It's an old expression that engineers always uh, overestimate what they can do in five years. And they underestimate what they can do in 20. And I think I want to add to that they can't imagine what they can do in 30 years. So thank you very much. Steve, uh, we, we enjoyed a little time in my office today, and I came away inspired from our discussion one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I can't tell you what this has done for me. I, I, I'm, I'm just, tr just wowed by your presentation and, and enormously proud to know that you, uh, you came from Rensselaer. You're a, a gifted orator. You have a very compelling story. Um, you've had a, a fascinating and inspiring career and I know uh, everybody here 
and everybody who can't be here today to hear this is tremendously proud of you. And as I think about the people who couldn't be here, I'm thinking and writing notes to myself about the many ways I can get you from Rochester back to campus to speak to as many of our students as possible. We have to make that happen. Be happy to do that. Um, at this time, I'd like to conclude the, uh, the ceremony and the lecture. I'd like to thank President Jackson, members of the President's Cabinet, the Board of Trustees, the faculty, the staff, and the students for joining us this evening. And I'd like to invite all of you to join us for a reception outside where Steve, I'm sure, would be happy to talk more with you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight.